That's great, mate. Unbelievable. Fantastic. Great to see. And Andrew's in. How are you, Andrew? Doing okay. Hi. How? Hello, everyone. Oh, it's great to see you. And look at that fantastic book, bookshelf behind you. That is very impressive. A, a scholar and a gentleman. That's tremendous. And my dear friend Kareem is back in the house. How are you? Good evening to you. Hi, I'm great. Just been preparing all week. We're having our yeah. weekly we're having our weekly date, mate. It's fantastic. I'm just trying to work on my signature hairstyle. Like you have. Each week I'm trying something new and one of these days I'm gonna get something and then I'm gonna go with it every day and I think it's really gonna your hair cut down on my give me more time for thinking. Your hair is magnificent. No, it's just like because I do a lot of exercise. I I don't like sweat. I don't like things around me. I don't like things around me. Um, Leanne would probably say that that's a more generalizable metaphor. So thank you for that, Leanne. But yes, yeah, so your hair is magnificent and we're going to talk tables. We're going to talk everything. And oh, and Leon, Leon's back. How are you, Leon? Good, good. I'm just fulfilling the challenge to look like a frog from uh, two weeks ago. So just proving it can be done. <laughs> that is just, and how appropriate is that frog for today, Leon? <laughs> You have just. Well, it depends how you orientate yourself, really, doesn't it? Well, I'm oriented towards you, Leon, today and uh, always. So, uh, right, my eyes suddenly left. That was just. Was anyone just slightly disturbed that Leon's <laughs> guys suddenly disappeared? And and I know the cat lawyers, uh, Joanna, I was straight there as well. So, look, colleagues, we've got the dream team in the house once more, the brightest people on the planet, and wow, we're going to have some fun today. This is a great book. This is a tremendously fabulous, flamboyant, interesting, controversial, I'm confused, I'm interested, I'm amazed, I'm in wonder book. So let's share it together as a family. So we're welcoming Queer Phenomenology to our gig today, published in 2006. And I think this was the first book that Sarah Ahmed published with Duke University Press that has been quite a big publisher for the second uh, stage of the commentary that we're going to talk about today. So look, I will commence as always with an acknowledgement of country, acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands, all the lands on which we meet today, elders past and present, and any Indigenous colleagues with us today. So a big hello to everybody. We've got another wonderful group of people here, and I'm thrilled to see you all from around the world. So look, queer phenomenology. Who knew this was a thing? Who knew this was a thing? I've read this book a few times, and I don't think I've ever understood it till I read it again on the weekend. And Karima helped me with it. She focused my attention particularly on tables. And look, we will have a table moment shortly. We'll all share as a family the table moment. But look, I did want to start, and Leon, mate, it's, it's good to see you, and you can maybe help me with the start, you know, it's involving the frog, really, but the notion of, mate, orientation, right? And the question starts in the book, what does it mean to be orientated? Quite an interesting word, that orientated, and, you know, that's about the sexual orientation, the what and the who, but Leon, see if you can help me, mate. I'm interested in terms of orientation. Does it mean for us turning towards something or turning away from it. I think in my life, I've tended to think it's a turn away. And I think Sarah Ahmed's focusing as it a turn towards. Leon, mate, where, where are you on the towards or against? Um, well, my first, first response would be situating a mum. So, I mean, whether you're orientated towards or away from something depends on how you are uh, or it's about your whole environment. I mean, you can't just have yourself at one table. There are many things in the room. So, I mean, the way you orientate things in the room is it's not just as simple as what's in front and what's behind. Yes, that's, that's clever. So you're not reading it, Leon, as almost an emotional state, because I suppose I went, maybe it was the leftover from last week's book, mate, the, the notion of disgust or fear. So I was sort of dealing with orientation as we're moving towards this experience or away from this experience. But you're seeing this as much more complex, like a, a meaning system or a proxy, in fact, a proxemic system that we're, uh, we're rebounding around it. I like this word proxemic, yeah. I mean, things are not a, a simple, it's, it's not a simple one-to-one -one relationship. We all belong into, a, into society, into a culture, into something much more complex. And the orientation has to be part of that. Absolutely fascinating, mate. You're a legend. Leon is a legend. Joanna, can I just involve you in the Handmaid's Tale at this point? Because obviously you, sure. would, you, you would be agreeing with Leon on that. 
because it is the Handmaid's Tale as a universe. Most fictions are like this. In terms of orientation, it is it is proxemic. It's a whole system, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. You, but, but if we're dealing with Gilead, so if we are, you and I, because you and I were talking about this, if we're dealing with Gilead, yeah. do, do most fictional worlds, conf, uh, you know, are they configured around an orientation? So could we read Gilead? Could we read all fictional worlds as an orientation in that way? Um, yeah. Why, yeah. So either... I mean, I guess all fictional worlds are oriented around an idea or a concept or a character or a mood. So Gilead is a, yeah, is a physical manifestation of a mood or a political trend or a fear. I'm going, to, okay, I'm going to push you. You're doing brilliantly. <laughs> That's fantastic. Because this is hard, right? Because as I said, this book really opened me up and Leon's already sort of altered my orientation. But what if we said that misogyny was an orientation? And yeah. misogyny was the orientation of Gilead. And okay. it creates yep. the attraction towards particular uh, patriarchal structures and an orientation away from uh, women-centred power structures. Just putting that out there. Yeah, that sounds good. I could be absolutely wrong, though. <laughs> I mean, it... <laughs> Do you... I'm just going to riff off that and say um, I got caught up this morning watching a bit of the live uh, prosecution evidence for the Trump impeachment. And at one point they show... Um, it's, yeah, it must be it must be footage from one of the mob going through the Capitol, and you don't see the person, but you hear a voice, and he's going, "Nancy, Nancy, where are you, Nancy?" And it was the creepiest example of patriarchal terrorism that I have ever seen. This, these were people that were searching for Nancy Pelosi to, they say, are claiming to kill her. Um, so in terms of misogyny being an orientation, there is someone moving through a space uh, directed by that misogyny and other things um, to, yeah, to do harm to a person. Okay, my head's just exploded. Uh, <laughs> Joanna, that, that's remarkable. And I just think for you, because obviously I was hoping you'd be with us today, I think that orientation, particularly Leon's rendering of, of that orientation, is fascinating for, for Gilead. But I also think looking at wonderful Alyssa, who's with us. Good, good morning, Alyssa, who's working, of course, on gaming and women's history of gaming and basically lives in several fictional worlds. And that's just her house. Uh, <laughs> Alyssa, mate, do you want to talk to me about orientation and objects? Because this is your party, mate. Do you want to say good morning to the hood? Good morning. Hi. Right, the hair's still looking green. That's great. Um, I don't know. Well, talk to me about the fictional worlds because you've just written this fantastic comment there, mate. Well, I was just thinking that, like, what you're, what you are shown, like, so when you're making a D&D &D module, right, so when you're making an adventure, you end up with a very narrow kind of story world, right? So it might only be a dungeon or it might be a town and then you have to make assumptions as to how that fits into the greater kind of, like, world and how that it operates so there's kind of tropes and, and underlying logic to it so i guess it's kind of what you are shown or what you choose to include and then what you choose not to include based on assumptions or not not necessary stuff which means that you can end up with quite a lot of like logical holes and, and i think you know when we read books or, or watch movies all the time there's stuff and you're like that doesn't really make sense but they the creator hasn't really taken the time to include that object or that kind of logic because it wasn't part of the scope almost. But I guess your own personal orientation might affect what you consider part of the scope and what you're looking at and what ideas you're kind of moving towards. Right, huge. 
right now. You and I, let's look at each other and go for this. So in the configure in the configuration of fictional worlds, including science fiction, do the objects and the orientation, so in other words, the proxemic system that Leon started us with, are they more urgent because they are in many ways on the simulacrum? They are overtly and must be disconnected from the real and there's a gap there. Maybe. I don't know. I don't know. How do you create believability in gaming cultures? How well, do you create got, the investment, the, the authenticity in the gaming structure? Well, there's that suspension of disbelief idea and like how far can you push something before it becomes ludicrous, I guess. And, and I think for different people, maybe that suspension of disbelief is uh, in a different spot. Um, yeah, so, so I guess plausibility is affected by your own kind of what you're willing to accept is reasonable. That's huge, Alyssa, well done. And I'm gonna go straight to Andrew. Andrew, say hi, mate. The notion of immersion, I think is magnificent. Can you just add a little bit more, just work with me on this, um, Andrew, yeah, mate, because um, obviously this is crucial for both Joanna and Alyssa, if we can get this right for them. Um, well, immersion, I guess, in the context of gaming has to do with a sense that you inhabit a world that you can um, position yourself in relation to um, certain items in your environment or certain non-player characters or even other players. Oh, that's helpful. So that investment or immersion is almost the punctuation for authenticity in simulacrum environments. So that is the orientation and uh, Alyssa answer your own question therefore thank you thank you Andrew man that's brilliant what answers your question Alyssa what is the break what's the snap in the immersion uh, I think it, it it depends sometimes when we're playing when I'm playing Dungeons and Dragons I can accept that like a spell will produce like 300 tons of water and I'm like yeah that makes sense but then I'm not, and I'm, then I'm allowed to use a lightning spell inside. And I'm like, where does the lightning come from? So, like, why is lots of water appearing out of nowhere, okay? But thunder not. And I think for me, a lot of the time when I'm reading books, the interaction between characters can be a real immersion breaker because sometimes they'll say something and like, nobody talks like that. Like, that doesn't make sense. Like, I can accept that there are, like, green unicorns, but, like, Obviously. nobody still, like, uses that lingo or, like, that's not how a 16-year-old talks. Do you know what I mean? So I guess those break points. So, darling one, there is no doubt in my mind that orientation through the Ahmed configuration with the great work that Leon's done, that's crucial for you. Thank you for that incredibly uplifting expression, Alyssa. You, exciting. You, exciting. You go. I'm proud of you. Can I go to the wonderful Amanda? And I've seen the wonderful Gail is in too. So, hi, Amanda. How are you? I'm well, thanks, Tara. Sorry I missed last week. I've listened to it twice, though, to, to compensate, and I kept interjecting to myself when I'm listening, so it was wonderful. Well, you, you, you are always missed, and you are a light in our lives. And, and look, you and I, I'd like us to have a moment, if we can, here, you and I. We have many moments, you and I, but let's have one now. And I hope you can help me with something I was fascinated in in this book, and I, I know is important, and I don't think I've quite got a grasp of it yet. But it's the notion of arrivals and departures. And I'm seeing probably Leanne nod as well on this. So arrivals and departures are a big deal. And the great phrase she used was, it matters how we arrive at the places that we do. So it's that maybe that point that Alyssa was talking about, about narrative, why we believe in the green unicorn or the 100,000 litres of water, but we don't believe in something else. Now, I've been thinking a lot about arrivals and departures in this book. And I wonder if we think about it, Amanda, in our lives, do the arrivals matter, how we arrive in a job, arrive in a relationship, arrive in a research project, arrive in a degree, do, do the arrivals matter and are they narrativized? And I wonder if we're forgetting about the importance of departures in this, because I suppose in my life, Amanda, I've often thought the leaving matters more than the arriving, but maybe that's because I'm an old goth. Can you just talk to me about the the arrival variable in this? I think arrivals and departures are 
equally important because they both have, well, they both reflect, obviously, our lived experience up to that point. Mm. Um, and this is going to affect our orientation as to how we interpret how we get somewhere. I mean, we don't just arrive magically unless you're in a game. Um, it's, it's a process. So can we, yeah, yes, I guess they're both equally important. Um, and, and, um, yeah, I, I don't really know where to go with that. I'm a bit. Look, at, look, let's, let's keep playing with this. I see, I see Thomas is having a great go with this as well. See, I've always had the cliche and I wrote this so I can claim it, but, you know, I always said beginnings matter, but endings matter more. And I've sort of accepted that as a trope in my life. And it's interesting. Was it, was it Andrew? I just want to check that every arrival has a departure. Oh, I was Leon. Hmm. Every arrival has a departure. I think you can probably stay in some, my, my vibe Leon was probably you can stay in some context forever. A lot of people sort of live in this dreadful environment and can't find their way out would be my argument. Talk it's, to it's a continuum. I mean, you don't, you, you're never stationary. You are always changing your positionality in relation to, you know, the, the, the proximity of what's around you. So, um, yes, you can be stuck in certain situations, but I don't think they're static at any point. There is always a an internal shift, whether or not you are cognizant of it. Um, and yeah, I, I think that, as was said, that you know every departure is linked with an arrival, and vice versa. Yeah. It's it's that continuum, which is what kind of she talks about as well, is that there, there is no stasis. It's, it's, it's a continual movement in relation to something else. And of course, Amanda, that works beautifully with Adrian Rich's sort of lesbian continuum as well. So there is an interesting mapping with Adrian Rich's work as well. But beautifully said, Amanda. Gal, can I just go to you to add a little bit to higher education here on this one? Because, you know, we, we, and of course, this might help Aidan as well and Aidan's work, Gail, but for those of us and a lot of us work in international higher education, it's a very tough place to be in at the moment. And a lot of people are just hanging on, you know, as the precariat or the adjunct workforce in universities. And, you know, there must be a sense that in some ways you never sort of arrive as a worker in international higher education and you're not a, sort of never leave like Hotel California, you know, you can check, out, check in any time you like, but you can never leave. H how are arrivals and departures operating in higher education as a workforce, Gail? Have you, have you got a thing on this? Because it yeah. feels so unstable, mate. It's, it's completely unstable, but it's also completely gendered and racialized and, and the, you know, ableism runs through all of that. So I think if you're talking about how you arrive and whether or not you feel you fully arrive or are fully included. I think that that really depends on your journey, mm. who you are, what your social being is, what you've experienced, and how and people's perceptions are of you. So I think that um, I think it's a really complex space. Yeah. I think that there are many, many people, and I understand it, banging on the door to enter, but many of us who have entered <laughs> are wondering why we worked so hard to bang on that door, mm. um, or where we've got or we're, we're trying to change the ground on which we are situated within that space. So we enter a space as us because of a journey. Yeah. So we take that journey with us, of course. And then when we're there, you know, there's been discussion about the continuum and about the lack of stasis, but actually that's also positive because surely that means that the terrain has capacity to change in a positive way and that our place in that space can have a positive impact on the location or the environment, the space or place that we're in. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a really tricky space to be, but it's also a space of possibility. So I love you, Gail, you're always so much more positive than me, and that's why I, <laughs> I love you in my life, because I just have this feeling using sort of the positionality orientation work this week and I sort of was straight into the higher education workforce that none of us can hold our ground at the moment yeah. that you know if you ask me you know what am I facing towards or what am I working against I don't know where the hell I am most of the time you know what is you know, all that solid melts into the air I, I'm not sure in international higher education what we're holding on to I, I'm not sure I think we've lost the project your 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 position though what you stand for 
who you stand with doesn't have to change. So that, that orientation can help navigate what is a priority to you, how you, how you engage with those competing imperatives, etc. cetera. Um, you know, people, I go back to, I go back to drama all the time because that was my first discipline. Yeah. That's my first language. And um, there's a beautiful character called John Proctor in one of our familiar's plays. Um, I think it's from The Crucible. And he says, for I have my name, I cannot take another. And he will not stand on oath against something that, that, that he cannot stand for. And I keep coming back to that. And when I'm asked to compromise, I can compromise to a certain extent, but I cannot compromise to the extent that it, I lack integrity in who I am and my positionality on something. Um, so for me, I take what comes at me, yeah. but with a very clear sense of what my position is as a general set of principles, if you like. Oh, you are amazing, Gail. You, you are amazing. I don't, I don't always do it well. <laughs> see, and the tragedy is I, I'm not sure I do it at all anymore. I, I just, as you know, I sort of really feel like, and I use this metaphor a lot, I do feel like I'm in sort of a 1968 Yoko Ono performance art experiment. And, and <laughs> meetings feel like that to me. So it's like, is this a meeting or is this a happening? And I, I'm, <laughs> never quite I'm never quite sure. I feel that disoriented in higher education at the moment. Look, I'm sorry to laugh because I just think that there's some, there's some liberation in that, isn't there? Oh, <laughs> there is. But like, I also, yeah, but I also understand that it's crushing. Yeah. It's very, very difficult to retain your name. If we go back to the metaphor of John Proctor, yeah. um, it's very, very difficult. And um, it's interesting because I've been trying to fight for um, academics agency within a role that I have now in my school. Yeah. And I've been fighting for consistency doesn't mean uniformity. So these are the things that I've been trying to give agency back to academics to say, look, if you give them the principles by which to work with, they will flourish and they will do it in a way that's nuanced to their discipline and in, in relation to their students that is authentic, et cetera, et cetera, instead of this box to fit that we have to have this amount of within a sway and this much of a video. And anyway, yeah. and we I've been fighting and life. fighting and, and, and getting and, and not getting anywhere with it even though it's been evidence-based, so I've been coming in with the evidence. Um, and I just received, that's why I was a little bit late, apologies, but I just received a, a phone call out of the blue from a colleague that I don't know very well to say, hey, just want to say thank you. We know you didn't win, but we kind of know that you did the fight. And I hadn't made that quite public, by the way. Yeah. Indiscreet and of me, like I'm doing now, <laughs> completely yeah. indiscreet. But it would have been indiscreet within the context of my school to do that publicly because I was taking on somebody in a position of seniority. But, but Gail, that's remarkable because there is power. I mean, there's power in the union, but there, there is power in the fight. And I think while you can still find orientation in the fight, and you know, you've often heard me say, and not be wedded to the outcomes. That's where I'm trying to get to actually, because if we're wedded to the outcomes, the outcomes become a KPI and it's the path to madness, I think. But, but it's, I, I, I'll, I'll wrap up because there's so many people make, oh, making no. amazing comments, but I'll say just very quickly, it's, it's, it's being reflexive of your positionality. So it's not, that's not static either. So the John changes, the name, who you are changes, but, but holding on to some fundamental beliefs and values, regardless of, they, they will take you into those spaces. They, they, they are the momentum into the entry. That's why you're there because of these values that you hold and the beliefs that you hold, they take you there and they change the space that you enter because of who you are. Extraordinary, that, that's beautiful. And, and there's something queer in that too, Gail. There's a queer positionality to that in, in, the, in the mobility, I think. Extraordinary. Um, Thomas, mate, you've captured exactly what I think about this. Tell us, tell us about interviewing at the moment, Thomas. Tell us, tell us what that is, that is like. I'm with you, brother. What, what, what's going on at the moment in higher education and your part of the universe? Um, it's a NyQuil fever dream, first of all. Um, it, it's a mess. Um, it was really weird. Reading this book after the interview kind of contextualized a lot for me in terms of positionality and orientation. And so one of the things that kind of was very present through the whole process was that kind of the 
impression management that you go through through an interview process is both like incredibly intimate right now. So like y'all are in my room at the moment. And so I have to like make sure that this is encapsulating like nonverbal communication and, you know, some object manipulation that I would have done in person. But also my perception of this engagement, even in this one right now, like I'm just staring at a screen and I'm alone in my house. And so like, it feels, it, it's like a, uh, it's like the, a taste of human interaction, but it's not quite the meal, I guess. Ooh. And so that's kind of, it's been exciting because I get to travel around the world right now through my, you know, computer, but it's also like very distant. Like I haven't been at the physical university in a long time. And so you know, that has changed the way that I've worked. It's changed the things that I'm writing about and it's changed the way that I would normally talk and present myself in, say, an interview position. So it's been disorienting for sure. Look, Thomas, it's funny you say that you and I are linked. And by the way, you're never alone. You are stuck with us now, mate. Let me just put that out. <laughs> but can I say, Thomas, it's funny, you and I must be linked on it because, you know, this book is about many things. But as I was reading it, there was like this harmony line about where we are in international higher education. And that's, I was reading it about how we orient in the workplace. What does it mean to be an academic? And I went there too. Isn't that weird? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, um, and it was particularly weird for the administration through the interview process because they've hired at this particular school, like 18 people and only nine of them have moved to the town already. And so they're kind of sitting there like, well, when COVID lets up or when vaccines happen, are they actually going to move here? And if they do move here, are they going to be oriented to do the work or are they going to leave after a year because they don't actually want to live in a tiny town in New Mexico? Ooh. So it's very uh, anxiety ridden for both admin and candidates at the moment. And Thomas, it's interesting, I said to Gail when Gail was offering her wonderful commentary that it's now like working for Ford. Universities, it used to be, we used to sort of laugh, like, oh, we, we, don't, we don't work <laughs> down the assembly line. And actually, we do. Uh, we mm -hmm. really do. But what COVID has done is it's, it's cut up and fragmented the assembly line once more. So it's thrown the assembly line up in the air. And so all the functions may or may not fit together again. And the chances are they won't fit together in the same way and work will radically transform. Mm -hmm. One of the, and I kind of laugh at the idea of Zoom fatigue, because I wonder how much it is of just like physical exhaustion from staring at your computer for so long, or if it's being uh, removed from the physical workspace and the social environment that made your work bearable. And so now, you know, you've stripped away the social, the coffee hour, the conversations in the hallway, and you're left with the job that you had to justify in the first place through those social interactions. Like, I love the people, but I don't necessarily love the work. Right, you just changed my life, Thomas. You you are stuck with us for the next 50 <laughs> years if I can just stay alive, right? You are, you are a legend, Thomas. It was worth getting up this morning to spend this time with you. You are a legendary human, mate. Thank you very much. Did I will you? not complain about being stuck. <laughs> oh, you are, you are not stuck. You, you're with us, you, you're amazing. And look, we were always going to go here, colleagues. Um, Karima and I were going to spend time with the table. So, Karima, my darling, hello. Hello. Let's, should we going to go to the table? I mean, the hair looks great. You know, the hair looks great. Are, are we going to? Uh, are we going to start with the table? Look, the table appears. The table is the closest object nearest the body of the philosopher. I'm loving this. Tables are what philosophy is written on. Scratches on the table. What do we learn about the everyday orientation of academics through the, through the table or the desk? What, what's going on there, mate? Well, okay. I was thinking also just, I like that word riffing off, riffing off what Thomas was saying. This whole work from home situation has, you know, many people are trying to make workplace work stations you know, I've got three kids working from home, a husband working from home, myself from home in a small house. So it wasn't intended for all of this, you know, all these surfaces that are required now. 
And that made me think of her discussion about the furniture stores. I thought that was so interesting. And at first I thought, what is she talking about? You go into a furniture store and they're telling you how to live your life. And then I thought about the working from home thing and all the reconfiguring of spaces. And I thought, yeah, these don't have to be bedrooms. The kid that, you know, we don't, you know, just this idea of how predetermined and prefab housing in certain parts of the world can be. But that's what else I found about her table discussion. I thought about, well, what about cultures that don't use tables or don't use tables in the same way we use tables? So she was talking about a very specific type of philosophy done in a specific way, you know, and then I thought about laptops, just the word laptop, you know, the laptop is supposed to get rid of the table in a way. So I thought that was interesting. And of course, because I'm a mother, I really appreciated her small little paragraph about the mother being pulled away and the poles and draws and, and experiencing the table different, differently depending on your background. The background piece was my most, you know, got me thinking the most is this idea of what gets taken for granted and what's in the background and how much, I don't know what the word is, but how much goods you know how much richness and information or i can't think of the word but such good stuff in the background you know we always focus on the foreground and what's in the foreground the background and actually the fun. background is saturated it's saturated in meaning and you know I'll go back to old-fashioned semiotic it's the unmarked sign so we often don't have the language we don't have the vocabulary to understand what's happening in the background and then when the positionality happens and the orientation happens what can the background ever become the foreground? And I think it can, but mm -hmm. again, if it is phenomenology, there's a there's a consciousness to that flipping. And I, I wonder when, I mean, maybe we've lived this, maybe that's what COVID is. It's the consciousness of what is our home has become the workplace, and we've had to do that consciously. Maybe this is the moment. Well, it makes me think of of uh, like the slant right just the looking at the background coming to the foreground I understood it from what I read was her way of saying like you know you're literally looking at the room from a different angle kind of thing so you start to notice things it's like I'm in parent mode right now so they say you know you want to baby proof your house I didn't do this this is what they say well get down on your hands and knees and crawl around and see what the baby sees you know so it's just that reorientating through a, a physical different perspective and of course zoom has done that, <laughs> done that for us all zoom has done that because because suddenly we we're seeing everybody's background you realize so for us your background behind your head is our foreground mm -hmm. wow um, you are amazing. And can I say, I don't know about you. Also, can I just put a meta point? I'm doing a weird piece at the moment on the last desk. So I'm actually looking at, I haven't told even Leanne this, but I'm actually doing a piece on Steve's last desk. So the desk when he died. And that's a, you know, that's a very, and so I, I'd forgotten about, you know, basically the two chapters on the table in this book, because it's been so long since I've read it. And actually, isn't it remarkable in a monograph that something seemingly as small as a Searle's desk becomes sort of the trope and the argument for the book. I thought that was, you know, that's amazing intellectual work there. That's quite inspiring, isn't it, mate? Oh, I just got a nod from Kramer. Yes, I got a nod. But but it is very inspiring, isn't it? It's extraordinary that something that would seem to be in the background is suddenly the foreground and so rich for building theory. And also, you know, if you look at it from a new materialist perspective, this notion of our connection to but the, the desk, say it is made from wood and, and working from the desk is made from timber, but that has had a life. It continues to have a life. There's a, there's a, it has an energy, it, it vibrates, it interacts. You know, we were talking about effect last week. There's an effective relationship between me and that which on which I work. And so, you know, your relationship with that desk, Tara, is really rich and resonant because it was a desk on which Steve worked, yeah. on which, which actually supported the fruition and the development of his ideas. There's an in interaction there. I think, that, I think it's a very powerful. Oh, and, and lives longer than he did. 
extraordinary. So it's a very rich, but again, it's a, it, isn't it inspiring, Gail, it, working in the humanities in a time when most of, most of us, most people think that we're sort of a turd on the bottom of the shoe, to take something so small and render it a flower and blooming. I found that as, as someone who writes books, that was very, very um, evocative for me, I thought. I thought it makes you sort of proud to be a human working in the humanities, really, having read that. I thought that was superb. Um, Dr. McCrae, good morning. Good morning. Now, you know where I'm going with you, and, and this, I, I would like you to write this up as a piece, hashtag no pressure. But Okay. It, okay, yeah, whatever. Um, there's yep. a whole thing in this book about field of vision right? Mm. And how does the object arrive in one's field of vision? There's a lovely moment that I, I've used as a much bigger idea that she just mentioned about Derrida's use of perhaps. I'm quite obsessed about Derrida's use of perhaps. She makes it a bit small paragraph. I think that's a, you know, a perhaps moment. I think it's a great Derridean moment. But I was wondering, you and I have touched on this the last few weeks, Leanne, but in terms of field of vision, disability has been absolutely invisible in in these books you know really all the way through and we're not going to see to be frank too much even even the last few books we're going to look at now as you and i know your research is magnificent on this 20 percent of most nations population have a disability or impairment so how can citizens with a disability manage their field of vision and and how effectively have ableist cultures been able to exclude disability from the field of vision? Well, here we have a contradiction because people with disability are both centralised and completely excluded from the field of vision because they are an object to be stared at, to be gazed upon, to be fetishised, to be othered, and through that process to be then separated and placed in another orientation yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, you know the disabled body is 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 such a diverse body and it's such a a, a space of conflict a, a space of arrival and departure simultaneously yeah. of how a body arrives in space how it departs a space how it arrives in meaning and how it departs from meaning yeah and so we have you know, both things. We have disabled bodies embodying disgust, this idea that that body is so uh, fraught and so different that we we have trouble recognising it as human. Mm. Uh, arrival into humanity, you know, that moment. And then we also have disabled bodies that we then don't see as disabled. They're not disabled enough. So the passing argument, so passing as able, yes. Yes, yes, but you know, even to the extent you know, people get harassed for, for parking in a disabled parking spot, for example, because they don't, where's their wheelchair? Got it. You know, because there's a particular disability as a rival. What does it mean to arrive into a disability? Mm. And how does that arrival get encoded by other people and how other people are oriented by that? Because you fit a particular mode of disability so you orient the other person to oh you have a disability i know now how to behave with you nice um you know and so that's you know orientation is very what i how i feel about her use of orientation is that it's it's up it's very unstable and i think this is a theme that's been threading through our entire conversation that higher education is very unstable i've never arrived in higher education no I've never arrived my work desk is has never been in an office at a university in fact they gave me an office and I never used it uh, you know my work desk is here I'm, I'm at it right now yes. and I think you know higher education orients you into instability right now yes. and it has done so for a very long time we're only just now seeing it now spread it now properly arriving that orientation of instability yes. and you know, I've worked in the adjunct academy my entire life, so I've never arrived. I've never, you know, gotten a proper proper job. I've only ever, you know, had, you know, piecemeal kind of bits of employment here and there. Mm. Um, so this idea of, you know, field of vision asks us to, uh, right now is asking us to orient in multiple uh, places at once. And I think this is like capitalism fragmenting. Huge. And... 
you know, whereas, and I think it's actually, uh, it's incredibly in, unstable, but it's also incredibly liberating. Right. Because we now have multiple forms of orientation, multiple ways of facing the world, multiple ways of um, seeing the cracks in how we are oriented into particular ways of thinking and being. And this is what I like so much about disability studies is that mm. this space for playing with these ideas and the space for seeing at the cracks in how a reality is formed and oriented and arrived at is, is absolutely threaded through critical disability studies. Look, that, that's phenomenal, Leanne. I, I and see people that have had, all had a major moment, an existential moment in the morning, in the middle of the day, in the middle of the night on that. And it's the weirdest thing because, you know, you and I in some ways are, are polar opposites, even though we've been mates most, most of our adult life. But it's funny in that I suppose I had the supposedly stable academic career in our relationship. And I realised about 10 years ago that that tenure isn't worth anything at all. It's not worth anything because the academic environment is so hostile that every single one of us is one day away from going to need another job, right? So once I realized that and I lived that reality, I think, what did I have three or four jobs in a two year period going from toxic workplace to toxic workplace to toxic workplace, you know, just a nightmare. And it's funny you said that, then that becomes liberating. Because then it does become like, again, a 60s experiment where you go, well, you know what, this, my reality, my life, my identity, my purpose, my joy, my happiness is not going to be found in this workplace. So, yes. so and, and that there's a liberating thing there that I am, phenomenology, I am with intentionality, if, if any happiness or light is going to be configured in this world, I can no longer lie to myself that work is the pathway to that. Yes, absolutely. I think we, we've done that for a very long time. That, and that's how capitalism keeps fooling us because we keep thinking about that's where we're going to find meaning and that's the way we structure our lives. And, you know, when COVID blew up everything and everyone all of a sudden was, you know, oh, my God, I'm, I live in isolation. <laughs> you know, this, is, this is my jam. You know, I'm not trying to make light of it because it's a very serious situation. But, but for know, some of us, lock, lockdown no is normal. <laughs> You know, for me, this is, you know, my, I, I mean, uh, Karima was talking about how to repurpose multiple surfaces, and I really love that argument. I think that's really great. Um, you know, but, you know, I have a huge office, like, yeah, you know, <laughs> we're welcome to it. It's know? most people's houses. No, I know. Yeah. Your office is a thing of great beauty, madam. Thanks for oversharing. That's great, Leanne. I know. You're welcome. <laughs> But I, but I know, I mean, that was a really powerful moment. I see Romy's had a wonderful go on this about arrival and departures. And also, I suppose, Romy, thinking about Leanne's example there, she has neither arrived nor departed. She is in. And I think there's something about being, you know, still as well, stuck in the middle with you as well and managing that liminality. And look, I'm going to borrow you, Leanne, for one more moment before I move to Aiden, because I want to go to comfort which is a word I'm a bit obsessed with at the moment. And you notice comfortable and being comfortable and of comfort is quite a trope in her work that we've seen developing. So the notion of comfort, as we move into her happiness material, comfort will become important. Now, you'll notice what, quote, whiteness may function as a form of public comfort, end of quote, and bodies stand out when they're out of place, which works beautifully, I think, with disability as well, Leanne. And there's great work on whiteness in this book. The work on diverse bodies, though, I would argue is less so. Do you notice there's how we in, in life, how we manage larger bodies, how, you know, bodies have to fit into a particular chair and particular seatbelt and how the culture really can only manage particular types of bodies. And there are structures around that provide the proxemic codes that your body is welcome and your body is not. Where, where are you on that, Leanne, before we move to Vida Layton and talk about whiteness and comfort and politics? Yeah, look, I think she's absolutely right. I mean, I think there are, we, you know, it's a society built for certain types of bodies and we see that in inaccessibility. You know, the way in which you know, our, our, the way in which our urban design is even thought about it before we even begin building the building we don't think about accessibility and you know you know, you start looking at the stuff I was you know I'll, I'll never forget the time I was in a cafe it was completely accessible you know wide door you know no step 
awesome, thank you, three steps up into the toilet. Hello. So, yeah. so we'll, we'll feed you in an accessible fashion, but if you need to actually get rid of the food at any point, that would be a problem. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think there's definitely this kind of, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, we don't even think about how different bodies occupy space very differently, how a light and sound affects different bodies in different spaces as well. And how, you know, I, I think that's incredibly important. In terms of the idea of, of whiteness and comfort, I think that's incredibly resonant right now. I think, you know, I think part of the, the terror that we're seeing in, you know, late capitalism uh, on a particular type of white male body is about comfort. It's and, and and it's a tension of comfort. It's a it's a there's a there's a contradiction between an expectation of comfort and a reality of comfort. Mm. And I think that gap, that di cognitive dissonance, Tara. Cognitive dissonance, Leanne. Yeah. <laughs> Is, is is where we're manifesting what it, it is actually manifesting in rage right now people you know, these people aren't able to actually manage that cognitive dissonance and we're also seeing where people you know go and you know do the to that's what the toilet paper is about as well you know when people are freaking out and going oh, i'm going to buy all the toilet toilet paper that's about a perceived construct of comfort oh uh well done leanne um can can i go to the man, the myth, the legend that is Aiden. Hi, Aiden. Good morning, Aiden. Hello. Good morning. Um, right. Hashtag no pressure after Leanne finished on toilet paper. Yeah. Eh? <laughs> and, and again, it's still a Montego Bay shirt. Well done, Aiden. Uh, now, mate, I wonder because obviously you and I are doing some pretty heavy lifting in, in your thesis at the moment on identity, identity politics, Marxism, and identity politics. The new left, the old left, the post left. That's where we're working at the moment. Now, Aidan, how is this stuff about whiteness as a form of public comfort? How does comfort operate in identity politics and in terms of Marxism? And I don't know the answer to that, by the way, Aidan. So it's like comfort and do you have to be uncomfortable to argue for progressive politics? Oh, that's a question of a lifetime, really, Tara. Um, no pressure. Yeah. Um, I, yeah, I really like that question, actually. I'm very glad this is recorded. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I was thinking before when you were talking about higher education, I kind of, you know, my, my automatic snap thinking is to go to sort of structures and structural um, limitations around what is normal and, you know, like physical structures or those sort of, you know, I, I guess ideological structures or, um, you know, structures in our minds that, you know, might mirror physical spaces. So, you know, like in the disability space, obviously you've got, you know, stairs and things like that that are, you know, less accessible mm -hmm. but then in our minds i think we have when you're talking about academia it's more like try and trundle that model back into the academic space where we've got these structures of governance that that don't work for well they don't they don't work for anybody really right mm -hmm. like similarly to how i guess when we think about you know structures of capitalism they work for a very small you know, 1% or even less in many instances. I think when we think about that in institutions, we see that that same sort of, you know, the capitalist academic capitalism, that kind of structure replicated. But I think even less people benefit because we're not actually seeing, I mean, you know, maybe exclude our vice chancellor from this conversation, but the, the bene financial benefit, you know, is not being seen in you know management structures necessarily in universities in the same way that you know a, a private entrepreneur um, might benefit from you know things around them um, by you know by by extracting more value that kind of thing and I, I think that the structures that enforce and reinforce higher education the and particularly from a governance perspective that you know we have to do things by the policy if there's no policy we have to create the policy. Yeah. there's a real dissonance in that as well like i think there's a real fracture in you know because there's all of these policies but then we don't really like nobody really knows what they are and they don't know how to follow them they can't even read or interpret them and that's um, why you have to have a procedure because the policies don't make sense that's it <laughs> that's it yeah and so all of it gets really muddled up and nobody is benefiting like it creates a hard time for students it creates a hard time for staff and then i think you know arguably because we rub up against and if we rub up against these structures in the wrong way then people tend to 
they tend to rebel. They speak out. You know, I mean, they either they are either crushed under the weight of this immense structure, and you know that's a fair enough response to be honest. You know, like people can feel like there is nothing I can do. I have to leave. But, yeah, but others will go. This isn't right, and I want to do something about it. And it's really interesting to me how academia has had this trend, at least in reading the history of of you know white Western Australian academia, of crushing alternative those other views. Uh, e even in terms of preventing people from publishing and preventing those discourses from escaping from people who are, you know, sort of stuck in in positions that don't fit within this structure that's been built, that's been built on, you know, colonial, white, Western privilege, or comfort. Um, yeah, it's, a, yeah, so it's really interesting. It's kind of thought provoking, but I love, loved that starting question, Tara. That's fantastic. Well, Aidan, let's go once more because I, you saw I madly was trying to grab a pen there for a second, but I'll, I'll say it and at least then it's recorded. What if we start to develop, and we could have 22 people on this article. Can I just say we could be about to do an article and there are 22 people. So we've become medical science colleagues. We've got 22 people on this article. Um, our revenge. Uh, um, what if we deal with, what if politics is about the literacy of comfort and the literacy of discomfort. So politics emerges when the literacy to manage the discomfort is not there. So if we're dealing once more with the Washington riot, so we've got a community often of white working class crew who mostly have been okay in, in, in a forder structure. They've been mostly okay in a manufacturing industrial complex and yet did not develop a literacy of discomfort. So when discomfort emerged, the rupture or disjuncture resulted in rage. Is that something for identity politics for your modality to ponder, Aidan? Yeah, um, I, definitely, I think so. Um, the, I think the, the discomfort thing is really interesting because who experiences that at what time? Um, is a is a really interesting question because it's like there are people who obviously experience that discomfort more frequently and are, are forced to you know I think that's that was the interesting sort of that that I don't know my discovery your guiding but that that realization that there are people who feel that that level of discomfort in you know again the structure of academia they feel that discomfort everywhere they go at all times yeah. and there are others that have it some of the time and I think that you know there is a there is a sort of management of being able to deal with it and then not being able to deal with it and and whether or not the I don't know the discordant response or the you know the sort of acting out response of activism and things like that you know I think I think that is really necessary but it's really interesting how the you sort of some people are forced into this camp and others are sort of get to play in it sometimes there's something interesting in that too like the you know are you comfortable or not and and look, it's funny you're saying that, Aidan. So I'm torn too. I'm not sure if we've again got Adrian Rich's sort of lesbian continuum. We've got a continuum model of discomfort, or mm. actually it's binarized. Mm. And so it's, I actually it's, also, I also think I'll go again. I think it's a demand for comfort. Huge. I think I think there's a I think there's been a level of discomfort amongst these communities and they've been biding their time and waiting for, well, when do I get my comfort? When do I get to enter into that space of ease and effortlessness? And it's constantly being denied to me. And because it's being denied to me, I demand my comfort. I demand my entry into what has been promised to me. Magnificent. I can see Amanda's gone straight there with you, Leanne. And Romy, hello, Romy. Talk to me. Say hi, Romy. You've been offering basically haikus, these most amazing evocative comments on the way through. Romy, could you speak to us a little bit about the discomfort is provocation? I'm, I'm loving that. Can we have a go, Romy? Yes, I can. I mean, I'm speaking from England, so we're on a tightly, it's slightly different time zone. So please oh, bear with. Good evening. Um, Good evening. You are, it's 25 past 12 in the yes. evening. But just um, to say, yeah, I mean, I, I'm speaking with regard to Ahmed's very um, notable resignation from Goldsmiths yes. because of the discrimination she experienced and the fact that she didn't go silently. Yes. And I think if I think about what um, queer phenomenology offers it, and amongst many of her books, I mean, her work around diversity 
um, complaint as diversity work. I think that always she's so on point about naming the problem. And indeed she says, you know, when you name the problem, you become the problem. But I think that um, back to your point about comfort and discomfort, mm -hmm. I think there was a point where she exited the academy, not that she stopped being an academic, but she's exited the, for the academy in terms of a day-to-day -day role because of just the levels of discomfort. I mean, she's talked about vomiting before having to deal with the internal grievance process. She's been open about that in her blogging, what that did to her mentally, mm. um, that whole process of bringing a grievance, how toxic it was. And so, yes, I think um, it made me certainly think about the ways in which when we experience di uh, discomfort of whatever, and I'm using that, that's a mild term, but when we experience discomfort, I think that that is often an impetus to want things to be different for ourselves or other people. That's why we do it. That's that's the whole of the civil rights movement in America, which is my field of study. You know, that is about, you know, when, when you know that your being um, contests other people's idea of, um, mm, I'm trying to find my words here. Oh, when you know that you're going Thank you. <laughs> when you know that your being contests other people's idea of safety, for instance, you are considered a threat. Your very being is somebody else's sense of threat. Then you are you're likely in your lived, embodied day to day experience. You're likely to want to, I imagine. And this is, again, the impetus for something like the Black Lives Matter movement. You, you want to imagine a futurity in which that is different, not just for yourself, but for generations to come. Change is always driven by discomfort, and that's putting it mildly. And discomfort can be a substitute word for murder, death, any of those things. I mean, what happened with regard to George Floyd, the way, that, that at its most extreme is discomfort. Yes, and I, I wonder, I mean, the interesting thing, and I mean, of course, Sarah Ahmed, an incredibly inspirational academic in so many ways. I always wonder, though, for the thousands of academics who can't, can't leave the university, no matter what is occurring to them, they can't leave or exit a university be, because they need the money to, to live. So I wonder how because that doesn't become, I think that doesn't become discomfort, that becomes despair. And then we've got yeah. generations of academics living in despair that, that can't under any circumstances leave. And that's when we have the suicide of colleagues, obviously. So how we manage that's challenging, Romy. Oh, for sure. I mean, I can't speak to, though to every detail around Sara Ahmed's narrative. I have no idea with, I mean, she, from what bits that I've read, I mean, it, I would say that she suffered a breakdown. Yes. I mean, probably there may be people in this room who know more about her narrative, but I mean, it was not, it was not pleasant. And I think it was about jumping in order to save oneself. It was an act of rescuing oneself to leave. Yes. Um, so, yeah. And, and beautifully said, Romy, and thank you for that incredibly e evocative engagement with us as, as we're reaching the end of the seminar. It, it was worth staying up. Thank you for doing that. <laughs> thank you. You're fantastic. But ju just to finish off about lesbian orientations and how positionings can occur, Sarah Ahmed used the great phrase, I left the world of heterosexuality and became a lesbian, even though this means staying in a heterosexual world. So I wonder, Gail, just to finish off the last couple of minutes between you and I, obviously that's a fascinating model of insider, outsider, comfort, discomfort, belonging, not belonging, and not belonging, but still having to live with disempowerment. It you, that's, really, a, that's a wider model, Gail. I, 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 that spoke to me so deeply. Yeah, look, there's been some amazing insights in the chat here, um, but I might just briefly refer back to, because I think, it, I think it speaks to your question to a large extent. So somebody was talking, I think it, Leon mentioned something really interesting that I might bring up, which was the, the kind of expecting comfort comes from a position of privilege or not. Perhaps, you know, people never expect to ever achieve, but you can still rage against can't you? You can still rage against that which you may you, you may never expect to achieve, but that which you hope 
to achieve. Um, I, I, I can't follow Romy. <laughs> he was so beautifully eloquent and insightful that I have no, no wisdom to, to, to offer, except I, I think this idea of exiting or exiting an a particular academy, but not exiting the academy, exiting a particular sexuality, but not exiting the sexualized world, the heteronormative world. I think that, I think it's, um, I think we're talking about code switching. I think we're talking about navigating very uneven terrains um, and, and our position and our sense. Amanda talked about fear a little bit earlier in the chat as well, which I thought was really interesting. But when you talk about discomfort, you talk about other people's discomfort, and it goes back to what Leanne was talking about in terms of how other, how other bodies can be almost monstrosized, you know, in, in some ways, or, or the, the repulsive, being repulsive, but to other, other people. Um, so we're constantly, aren't we, navigating this very, very uneven terrain. And I, I, I speak back very, very quickly to something that I mentioned last week, really, really briefly. And that was when I, I raged at a situation that my daughter was in at school where uh, a friend of, of hers didn't know which team to sign up to because they only had boys teams and girls teams. Shocking. And exactly in the 21st century in the year nine classroom. And I raged against that. And what was really interesting was that I can still rage even though it's not my position in, in that I'm not, um, I'm in a heterosexual privileged kind of position here. And, and that propels me to action. And it does propel me to action because I probably write more emails to the school than anybody. <laughs> including, you know, education authorities, I don't think. But Gail, so the, the privilege demand responsibility. Demand response, ab absolutely. And, and will that arrive at a conclusion or a, a policy change that is more inclusive? One would hope so, but I don't expect it anytime soon. Um, but we're on a journey, and somebody mentioned earlier about clearing pathways. So I, I go back to the fact that I had that phone call a little bit earlier today, and I thought, oh my gosh, somebody's actually recognised a tiny thing that I tried to do that I was unsuccessful in doing. But even in that narrative of trying, there may be some space that has been cleared. So when we enter and when we exit, we're, we're, we are clearing paths, um, I suppose, if I'm going to come full circle and bring some kind of tidy, neat Cartesian ending. <laughs> the, the it's a beautiful structure and I think the discomfort can be a debilitating one and we've had moments of that today the discomfort can also be empowering like the grit in the oyster that creates the pearl the discomfort creates the propulsion and the momentum to mean more to do more and create space maybe not for us for our particular generation mm. but for many of the colleagues that will follow us. It's been a, a catastrophic uh, time to be involved in international higher education. That's pretty well my whole career. And, and hopefully the remarkable interventions that wonderful colleagues like Gail enacts makes it better and perhaps smooths out the terrain for the colleagues that follow. So everyone, thank you so much for this extraordinary hour extraordinary hour. I feel like I've had a pipe cleaner put through my brain and I've had a good clean. Uh, thank you all for your time early in the morning, in the afternoon, middle of the night. You are astounding humans. Thank you all. Peace out. Have a wonderful day. See you team. See you next week. Bless you. See you Karima. Right here. <laughs> Bye guys. Have a great week. You too beautiful. See you my Can't darling. Wait to Bye. See you all. Thank you.